Welcome back to our writing labs. I know we took a, a bit of a break from these. Um, typically, if we were in the classroom, we would be spending all week up to a week and a half um, having smaller writing lessons, um, writing specifically writing lessons, a lot of open office hours. And so I try to replicate that as best I could within our online classroom. And uh, way to go, those of you who did schedule office hours. It was honestly so nice to uh, see your faces. Um, and work through some some of your own personal writing stuff. It's um, I like knowing that everybody needs something different out of a writing classroom, and going to the writing center or meeting with me personally are some of the best ways that you can um, you can ensure improvement on your writing. Because I send these lessons out into the ether, and I may be speaking to a lot of people who it isn't helpful for, um, because all of us have our own kind of issues with writing, and I am here for you to work through those particular issues but very excited to read your revised papers excited to see how you guys process the revision um, and what your revision memos uh, how those read um, so let's move on to unit two we're going to really full-on start unit two on monday um, it's the one i'm excited for um, because we are covering formalized rhetoric and maybe that word is familiar to you maybe that word is totally unfamiliar to you maybe you're just thinking about rhetorical questions um and it's hard for me to not just sort of go into it right now because i am a rhetorician that's what i teach and most of my universities i teach classical rhetoric um and rhetoric of social justice and um and i love it it is uh it is it is I can't even use words to express it, how much I love it so much, because it's this power. So rhetoric is the art of persuasion, and it's knowing what tools you need to use with your language, with your tone, understanding audience, um, putting certain ar arguments together, using a certain strategy, avoiding a fallacy um, to end up being persuasive um, and persuade your audience. And sometimes the best rhetoric, you don't even know that you're being persuaded because it's so carefully wrought. Um, and we're going to be looking at a lot of different videos and reading some um, some different kinds of arguments that are not just about privilege, I promise, um, that uh, where we can evaluate other people's rhetoric. So it's really good for us to have an understanding of it so that we know when we're being persuaded, we basically just don't want to be duped by other people. We want to arm ourselves with that knowledge and almost this like sixth sense of, of understanding how we're being persuaded and then be able to do it effectively towards others. And we're moving into a more academic style of writing. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that's gonna mean over the, the next week or so. But how this differs, um, we are, are doing much close, closer reading than we were before. We're not just looking to see, oh, this is Roxanne's gay, Roxanne Gay's experience with privilege. This is how she words it. Oh, this is um, Tiffany Jana's experience with privilege. We're not just searching for people's arguments. We want to start looking at how they explain that. Um, you know, we could look at how Roxanne Gay gave, or actually both her and Jana, um, gave personal examples. That's a strategy that they use to get people to identify with them. Um, we can look at the choices that they made in their argument and figuring out, oh, what made that thing persuasive? Or if they messed up, what made that not persuasive? Looking at how it's constructed and why they are um, speaking in that way in the first place. Um, and we're really looking at just persuasiveness. Our writing from here on out is going to be persuading an audience. So the audience for this paper was somebody who didn't know our texts. And the goal for that was so that we would explain um, explain the different texts uh, so that there was enough context. Um, from here on out, you're gonna have more of a goal. And a lot of people enjoy this kind of writing a lot more. Um, and I do too. So what I wanna do today um, you guys are probably beat from finishing up your papers. I'm not going to demand a whole lot. I'm going to have a small activity attached to this. Um, <clears throat> but I want to just give a hint at the way that we should be reading text from here on out. And I tried to uh, model it and show um, something that none of us would normally read and is not connected to our, uh, our course at all to kind of give us a break. And also just a little writing tip that's step by step um, of how we can translate first person into third person because from here on out all of our writing has to be third person uh, and that means no I no me no I feel no I think um, and we can say the exact same things uh, in first person and it ends up being significantly more persuasive 
And uh, because, I mean, we don't have the, the subjectivity of I or me. It's still our opinion, but we're not drawing attention to the fact that you're the only one who thinks it. <clears throat> so for the last paper, I'm letting it slide. And that's kind of why I'm, I'm doing this lesson right now. Um, is that there was so much first person all the way through, but really the only part that should have been first person was your example at the very end, because it's literally about your life. But it is very difficult to break out of that habit of qualifying our language of, well, I feel this. It's, it's almost sweet the way that we don't want to offend others or push an opinion onto others. We want to acknowledge that not everybody thinks the same way. But if we're going to be persuasive, we need to seem pretty confident and say, no, this is the way it is. And that's the sort of the crux of an argument. If everybody agreed with everything you said, there would be no point arguing. And you could just give your thesis anyways and not have to back it up. The whole reason that you have to bring in examples, that you have to explain those examples and analyze them and go through the whole cookie situation is because people are going to argue with us. People may argue with your definition of privilege. So you had to give uh, quotes from others to help them understand why it is you chose that and why you think that that's a valid definition. And so that being said, you don't need to say like, oh, sorry, but like what I think is because you're going to go through and explain your point anyway. So um, I'm going to go through just first a couple myths of, of a third person language and also start to translate something on my own into third person. So Two myths. Uh, one is that third person, uh, people think that it, it means that it's objective and true. Um, you are not, I guess the other myth is very similar. You're not lying if you move a personal opinion into third person, as I mentioned, as long as you explain yourself. If I say in and out sucks, I'm sure some people will be pretty pissed off at me. Um, I didn't say I think in and out sucks. It's implied that I think that. I said it. Um, and I can't just leave that there because people are disagreeing with me. So I now have to give examples of why I think it sucks. I think they have a limited menu. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, they only have this, this, and this. Maybe I'll compare it with McDonald's and all of the various different things they have. By the way, I don't agree with this argument. I think In-N-Out is the superior fast food restaurant. Um, I am playing devil's advocate with myself. Um, so. It's, it's okay for me not to say I think it because I'm going to go and explain myself. And hopefully people will be persuaded by my points. They may not be, and that's okay. As long as I have logically made those points, um, I'm good to go. And what we're gonna be doing over the next two weeks is talk about strategies we can use to make our points really effective. So while trying to find something for us to break down, um, I, was, I was reading an article about obituaries, and we didn't really think about obituaries in newspapers or wherever else people post obituaries, um, these memorials to people who've passed away, but usually they're, they're fairly positive of that person, even if they kind of sucked. Um, that's just par part of what the style that you have to, to you know, do. And so even though you're giving facts about their life and quotes from, from people who like them, it's still a really biased piece of writing. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's still an argument. Like they're making an argument about who this person is and how they should be remembered. And they're omitting certain things and hoping that you won't notice that they're, they're omitting certain things. And so even though obituaries are written in third person, they're still pretty opinion based. And so I wanted to find uh, an obituary by a person that we may think of as more controversial. And when there's someone that we know and somebody who maybe is has a public persona that's controversial, it becomes very apparent how maybe they're trying to just sort of hide those things um, and steer you into a different area. And that's all done very expertly in third person. Um, so I, <laughs> I was looking through obituaries and there was nobody I could find other than like world leaders and people that not all of us know. And the one, this is very old. Um, but the one that I found was from three years ago uh, ish and it was Hugh Hefner, which I, uh, I have no particular affiliation with him whatsoever, but I thought it would be a fun person for us to study. If you are not familiar, Hugh Hefner founded, um, Playboy Enterprises, so Playboy Magazine and Playboy Bunny merchandise and all of that stuff. Um, 
And why is he controversial? Like, he has the association with sex. And in society, we're still very weirded out about sex or mentioning sex. There's a reason that we have so many euphemisms for sex in the same way that we have a lot of euphemisms for death. We don't like talking about certain things, so we find other ways to talk about them. And especially because in a time that Playboy was founded, like 50s, 60s, I honestly can't remember, like, it was even more so a taboo. And so he's always been this interesting taboo figure uh, that, again, I have no particular interest in, but I wanted a controversial person, and I found one. So... I want us to just look at some parts of his obituary because reading through it, I was like, oh, ho, ho, you, Laura Mansnernis. I have no idea how to pronounce that. Like, this is so carefully written because it doesn't really mention anything about any any of the like more trashy connotations, which I think a lot of people have about it. It's a very well handled, really respectful, um, very honorific uh, obituary. And as we look through certain parts, I want us to start to see those intentional choices that she's made as she's writing this so that we respect his memory as this innovator um, rather than this sort of sleazy dude that s- slept with a lot of really young women and partied. So I want us to first look at just even this image. Um, so Part of rhetoric uh, is not just the words that are being used, but also juxtapositions juxtapositions of certain images. Um, And so this is a really intentionally chosen picture. And if we were in class, I would love to hear um, what you guys notice in this. But I look at this and it looks pretty damn classy. Um, Red is a really luxurious color. It's a very deep color. We see the sheen of the silk. Um, I kind of want this robe. It looks very luxurious. Um, He's in a very classy setting. Um, Dark woods, intricately carved woods, um, low lighting. It's um, it's an over overall. It has a positive vibe. I hate that word, but a positive vibe from it. And so our tiny intro to rhetoric, when we're carefully choosing words, specific arguments, images, and tone to persuade the audience towards what you want to convey, there's a reason that we have this image and not any of the other images that you could put up there of him with women, his, his hands on their thighs, in bed with all of these women, even if this is part of a TV show in a bed that's shaped like a heart. You know, we, we see him in a very particular light, and that's intentional. It's very interesting to see the editorial choices of just random articles we click online. Um, whatever that first image is, that's their first way of persuading you. And we don't always know it um, if they're trying to cast somebody in a sympathetic light or if they're trying to demonize somebody. I mean, you could go to Fox News versus... Um, CNN and look at the way that they discuss the same story. Look at the images that they choose. Um, You can see something that maybe is a little more sympathetic in one and maybe a really bad photo of that same politician in the other one, completely depending on how they want you to think about it. So this is the very first small paragraph and we are not going through the same, the whole thing, but um, I, I wanted to just read this first part. So Hugh Hafner created Playboy magazine and spun it into a media and entertainment industry giant, all the while as its very public avatar, squiring attractive young women and sometimes marrying them well into his 80s, died on Wednesday, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So, this first line, aligning with his accomplishments, first and foremost, not public persona, not what people think about him, and I think this is a pretty respectful way to go about it. Um, especially as he is an American, people who are um, innovators in an industry um, are, uh, are, are prized that he made a lot of money, basically. And then this word is really interesting to me, squiring. And think about what that word reminds you of. Because my first thought is like squire, like, like Knights of the Round Table, ish um but squire is a very chivalrous word it's a word that like i don't know my grandfather would use it's a very old-timey word um that's kind of just like you know taking women you know 
dating women, but attractive women, but it's in this um, very courteous language. And so they could have said sleeping with or partying with. I think that probably would have been super rude. But that word is not a normal word. So I can tell that the author chose that one particularly because it does evoke something a lot more chivalrous and not slimy and skeezy. And so that's an example of diction. So this very careful word choice um, is what we call diction. Um, and most of the time we have to think about the language that we're using and the effect that we want it to have on others. And you can have more positive diction or more negative diction, which we're going to look at in a moment. Um, so I want to read this first paragraph, and I know there's lots of notes on here. Um, Hefner the man and Playboy the brand were inseparable. Both advertised themselves as emblems of the sexual revolution, an escape from American priggishness and wider social intolerance. Um, so I'll stop there again. This is a very interesting statement. So the brand and Hefner were emblems of the sexual revolution. So talking about the 60s, um, which is aligned with the first wave of feminism, um, which went away and like made the 1950s housewife thing um, more of a more archaic uh, and allowed you know, more women to be in the workplace and a lot of, a lot more freedoms, not all of them. But um, this makes him seem incredibly progressive, not not like skeezy and slimy, not not trashy or skanky. I'm just going to keep using adjectives like that. Um, but he's kind of this part of history, aligning him with this time period, the sexual revolution. It makes this seem like more of a legacy and that he was a part of something bigger than just industry. So very intentional um, correlation there. And then this word priggishness and wider social intolerance. So we could have replaced these words. Priggish is another great, really fun word of just um, being being very uptight. Um, and of course, social intolerance we see as very bad. But they could have replaced this with like an escape from American morality or escape from the a traditional family and family values. We hear politicians using the phrase family values a lot, and it's a good thing. Um, it's kind of a manipulative thing because everybody values family usually. So we don't really know what family values means. <laughs> um, but typically they mean just like conservative morality. Um, but this sounds bad. If you'd written American so like morality, that would be like, well, why, why are you escaping from that? That would be a good thing. So very intentional language that's supposed to make us feel a certain way. And that's where one of my favorite, favorite words comes in that's going to be super crucial for us as we're reading um, more next week, which is connotation. Um, so connotation is not the dictionary definition of a word. That's actually called denotation. Connotation is when there's this idea or a feeling that's evoked by a word. And a lot of these are common. So if you think of like maybe color theory, um, the color red, people align with like love or lust or danger because we see it in those contexts. And so we make those connections, which we can kind of bring in some blind spot stuff going on right here. Um, or the color um, blue we see as sadness because we keep seeing it, you know, resonate or peacefulness. Also, we think of things like the ocean or the sky. Green could be money for most of us. It's nature. Um, and in different cultures use it differently as well. Red in, in Chinese culture is luck. So it, it's not universal for everybody. There's some that are universal and some that are not. So other than colors, um, there's just certain words that feel better to us. So um, a lot of times because of their context. So the word um, take feels much better than stealing. They actually are the same action. It's the action of taking something, but one of them um, does carry kind of this different, this different meaning onto it. Or if you are calling, oh, I should have had an example ready ready for me a minute ago, um, saying that you are, this is one that I see in like nature documentaries, um, 
uh, the use of herding something. Herding is a word that you use for like cattle. Um, but the action is just like gathering. Gathering is a more so a softer word, has a better connotation to it than the word herding, which we align with livestock, um, which we don't value as much in society. Um, you can gather things or you can herd them. Same action, very different feelings about it. And you can change the way that somebody thinks about your argument if you use that kind of language. So if we go back to this guy, wait, can I go back to it? Yes. <clears throat> Obviously, social intolerance, intolerance, not good, um, and priggishness, not very good. <clears throat> What's interesting is they go on to say we're both, uh, both were derided over the years as vulgar, as adolescent, as exploitative, and finally as anachronistic. Anachronistic means not of this time. So you can, um, it's actually really good to look up Latin root root words, root terms. So like chronos um, is, is time. So um, it's not of this time. Um, but Mr. Hefner was a stunning success from the moment he emerged in the early 1950s. His timing was perfect. So even though they're acknowledging like, yeah, 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 some people thought vulgar, some people thought he was just sort of this horny teen, um, some people thought he was exploiting women, which honestly has been my opinion of him, um, but that word but right there has so much weight. Um, and this is actually a rhetorical strategy as well, which we will look at later. Um, they relabel him a stunning success. He's perfect. So yeah, they say all these negative words, but as long as we add those positive words at the end, it kind of cancels it out. So this last part, I think is really interesting. Um, he was compared to Jay Gatsby, Citizen Kane, and Walt Disney, but Mr. Hefner was his own production. He repeatedly likened his life to a romantic movie. It starred an ageless sophisticate in silk pajamas and a smoking jacket, hosting a never-ending party for famous and fascinating people. Um, so first looking at this last part, that's definitely carefully wording that. Like, a romantic movie, uh, he's, he's sophisticated, he's a sophisticate. Um, silk pajama, smoking jacket, never any party. So a lot of his parties were just like sex parties. <laughs> not all of them. Um, and I'm not trying to deride the man at all. Um, but definitely framing this in a really careful way, whereas perhaps there was somebody who did not like Hefner that much. They would have written this completely differently. And so even though this doesn't seem to matter how we read this or not, if you don't know anything about him, you could um, form an opinion of him if you just read this and weren't aware of the careful language. And so although this isn't very dangerous, we do see how this same thing is happening, let's say, within our political system. People only read one news site, and you can see the kind of language that they're using to describe a situation. We can see it now with the way that people are framing Black Lives Matter um, or, or framing police brutality. Um, very intentional language being used on all sides um, to show one is bad and one is the other. Um, and then the, the first part of it, even these comparisons, very carefully chosen people. Jay Gatsby, Citizen Kane, and Walt Disney. So all of us went to high school, so I'm sure we uh, are aware of Jay Gatsby. He's this very well-known figure. He's also very cinematic. Um, overwhelmingly a pretty positive dude, even though he had some problems and was super obsessed with Daisy in a creepy way. Um, but he's kind of, he's sympathetic. Citizen Kane, also um, a sympathetic character, if you've seen that film, um, very intriguing, maybe not like the best character ever, but um, this iconoclastic character. And Walt Disney, which I think is the most interesting. He's a beloved figure, and I would never in a million years think of comparing Hugh Hefner to Walt Disney. But here you go. There's a lot of power in that. Because without somebody realizing all the good feelings they have towards Walt Disney, now that it's in the same context as Hugh Hefner, they maybe, without recognizing it, start to associate the two. Nobody's going to outright say Hugh Hefner is Walt Disney, but this happens on a subconscious level. So much of what we talk about in Blind Spot happens when we read stuff like this, because we don't stop and, and like mark everything up like this. Um, that would take us forever. It would be insanely frustrating. And the last thing I want us to look at <clears throat> is, first of all, this picture is great. Um, there's a slideshow of other images, but it seems significant that they started with this. Um, blurred out, you can't, there's nudity. I'm very apologize. There's some boobs. Um, there is nudity in back of them, but he looks like some sort of, oh, some sort of like 007 figure smoking a pipe. He looks incredibly classy. Um, 
and and this is the way that he described his life uh, with with women. You know, he, we enjoy mixing up cocktails in an hors d'oeuvre or two, putting on a little mood music on the phonograph, inviting in female acquaintance for a quiet discussion on Picasso, Nietzsche, jazz, and sex. Like sex is thrown in there, but overall. This, this sounds like incredibly in, intellectual, like someone who's classy, not some like horny dude. All of this is created to put him in a certain light that's not good or bad. This is just the way, the control that people can have over language. So that was my little, little intro to rhetoric. Those words, uh, the word connotation, super important. We're going to get back to it. We do want to be able to learn how to mark up our, our, you know, readings like this, maybe not everything, but a lot of our activities next week are going to be doing this. How do we annotate to look at um, rhetorical language? And what do we even write down? So I'm going to use this and um, as an example of, of writing something in third person. So this person was written, this was written in third person. Um, it's clearly an opinion and yet it sounds very uh, authoritative. So I decided to just write like a very quick, like I didn't even proofread it. It's not well written. My own little response to it. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to read quickly. So after the news of Hugh Hefner's death, I thought I would feel a little more happy. I'm not a huge fan. It's difficult for me to be on board with a guy known for sleeping with young women, employing them to dress like animals and basically be a cocktail waitress for his rich friends during parties. As a pretty staunch feminist, I don't like the idea, like the idolizing of Playboy, mainly because of what it represents, the objectification of women, but also I just think it's trashy. I remember bros at my high school who had mud flaps with the iconic bunny logo and the bro hose, sorry, that's not a great term, um, actually wore rhinestone studded bunny logo shirts. It's a culture I just don't like. I went to high school um, in the Inland Empire and there were uh, a lot of people who were like that. Nothing against them, it's just not my vibe. So this is not academic writing. It's not written very well. Um, it also is completely through my opinion. But what I am telling you is that I can turn this into third person if I follow six basic steps. So let's do it. The first step is to literally just get rid of first person pronouns. Um, I, me, we, you, we, us. I know you is technically second person, but when we're thinking about first and third, um, it's closer to second. So I have a lot of them, but if I just took these out, just like omitted them, it would not work. <laughs> It'd be like, um, thought would feel a little more happy, not a huge, not a huge fan, but also just think it's tra like, that doesn't work. Like I'm, even if I take out the I, the pronoun, like I'm still clearly the one speaking it. It's still clearly from a, a singular point of view. Um, and there's not really much of an argument. It just, it is very reflective, um, mainly because I use a lot of internal voice. So when we use feel, believe, know, think, um, that stuff is dangerous for us if we want to be persuasive. So imagine if you were pulled over by a cop, which I know that's actually a pretty terrible example to use right now, and they said, um, I, I feel like you were going over the speed limit. I don't know what I would, I, that doesn't work for me. Like I'm still afraid of law enforcement. Um, but like it doesn't, can I see a number? Like I do you know I was going over the speed limit. Like that doesn't, that would not be authoritative at all. Or if you went to the doctor and they said, oh, I feel like you probably don't have coronavirus. It's like, well, I kind of want to know for certain this doesn't make me trust you at all um, because and this is might be controversial but like really in medicine you don't really know anything you a tester and perfect um, doctors are highly educated and they're using all the tools at their disposal um, and all of the training that they have to make the best guess um, but like there really is no certainty ever of anything um, but you want your doctor to say, you do not have it. To the best of our abilities, from the tests that we have, you do not have it. That still may not be completely true, but it still works to make that argument. So I actually have two moments of think and feel in here. Um, and I can't really, I could just take it out and say, um, but also it's trashy. 
I could make that claim. Somebody may argue with me, and that's fine. I can explain why I think it's trashy. Um, feel up here, I think I'm just going to have to omit because I'm, I am need to get rid of like the eye there. Um, so both of those areas will be things I need to fix. So how do I fix it? Um, we want to replace it with something visual. So if you are saying this person, or if we were in class, I could say, who's someone in our class? Um, Alex, you know, Alex, Alex is, is, um, is feeling bored. How would I know that Alex is feeling bored? What is a person who's bored? Like, what are the telltale signs? I could say, well, Alex is looking back at the clock. Um, he's sort of, he's nodding off a little bit. He keeps checking his phone. Um, he is looking at the door longingly. He wants to leave. Um, so all of those are visual things that I can then make the, the conclusion, oh, Alex feels bored. Alex is bored. Um, hopefully you're not, but you know what? I can't stop you. <laughs> Um, so we want to look at how we know something rather than just taking that kind of shortcut. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, this is going to be a little difficult for me to change. I'm just going to have to omit this entirely. I, I probably can't even talk about how I felt happy. Um, I'll talk about what we could do instead of that. This part, um, I think I just have to add a little bit more. I can't just say like, it's trashy. I need to back that up. Maybe I could talk about how people appropriate the Playboy Bunny in fashion and um, and how it's all focused on sex because all of this thing I remember, um, this isn't gonna work either because that's my own personal account. And if I'm taking myself out of this, I can't use that. Um, doesn't mean I have to just completely omit it though. So what I wanna do first is maybe add, like I'll, I'll revise that and here's what I came up with. So Hugh Hefner's death was met with mixed reactions appropriate for such a controversial figure. So I completely got rid of the, I thought I'd be feel a little more happy. And I tried to figure out what's at the root of that. The root of that is sort of the discomfort of like, you're not happy someone's gonna is, is dead. Um, you're not like sad about them. Um, there were, there was a mixed reaction from people, especially from feminist groups being like, fine, good. Um, and so I tried to use that instead, appropriate for such a controversial figure. Um, while iconic and innovative, should have he, and, he was, excuse me, he was generally known for his sexual proclivities and objectification of women, dressing girls as animals to serve cocktails to celebrity friends, piling into bed with them afterwards. So I completely rewrote this part. I tried to use the same idea, but I, I used language that was a little bit more objective. Um, <clears throat> I took out the feminist thing. I could maybe add that feminist groups didn't like um, how Playboy was was idolized. Um, I could maybe talk about how many high school um, you know, girls wore these shirts and I wouldn't have to bring in myself at all. So if you are using personal examples, you can abstract them and turn them hypothetical. So as I mentioned, this part, I added, while the parties were high class, the brand absorbed a sleazy reputation. The bunny logo leaked down from high class society into mainstream fast fashion and culture from truck mud flaps to rhinestone baby doll t-shirts worn by high school girls. I said the same thing and I didn't need to put myself as a character in there. I didn't need to filter this all through me. And yeah, I'm making an argument that this was other than just my school. And if somebody really argued with me, maybe I could find some other examples. But if I'm just giving a reflection and opinion, I can make this claim. Very importantly, and this is second to last step, connect any logical dots and explain any assumptions or define any terms. So this whole first section, I know I already redid that, um, but I wanna give some, some like examples for my initial claim. So I had said that I thought I'd feel a little more happy, um, which I changed to, there were a lot of mixed reactions. And so I wrote another section where I gave some examples of and reasoning. Um, I said it's hard to ignore how much of a journalistic innovator he was when he started Playboy in the repressive 50s. Sex was pretty much taboo. Not only was this a bold move, it was also pretty progressive socially. He featured women in his centerfolds that had a girl next door vibe. I know I hate that word. Um, 
one he said was intentional and he wanted people to realize that even the good girls liked sex. He published controversial fiction starting the careers of now famous authors who struggled, excuse me, to find a vessel for their art. When he opened nightclubs in the 60s, he hired African-American comics at a time when comedy clubs were still segregated. And I add a little concluding argument that I realized could be a thesis if I was writing this. Um, I'll still have to take out the eye. But while I don't personally like the guy, I have to respect him. He did a lot to give voices to repressed or marginalized people. And he did at least attempt to normalize the way we talk about sex. Um, <clears throat> when you switch something from, from first to third person, inevitably you are going to add more because you can't depend on, well, I just feel it. You have to give actual examples and reasoning. So this is a really good thing for us as college writers. If you are worried about not having enough content, just that act of translating, you're gonna get enough content, trust me, because you wanna make sure that your reader understands what you mean. And the last thing I did, I just got rid of conditional language because it made it sound not very certain. So I took out the pretty, pretty progressive, pretty much, I don't need that. Um, I rewrote this line of many still dislike Hefner, but he still commands respect. So I know I kind of blazed through that and this is a little longer, um, but if you feel comfortable writing in first person and you, you have writer's block, when you write in um, third person to begin with, that's incredibly normal. And you can keep writing in first person as long as you go back and change that stuff up. So I actually suggest that you write your first drafts um, in, in first person. Um, because it just it helps you just keep that that communication open that line open you feel like you're getting your thoughts out whereas when we try to write in third person a lot of times we feel like there's these gates that are up between us and our idea um, so check back on this when you're when you guys are writing um, this will be something that I look for in your drafts from now on if you're struggling to do it I would love to go through um, in office hours and help you guys out with it or help you identify some ways to go about it and that's how we do it so next week we are finishing blind spot chapter seven and eight and we're going to discuss the rhetorical triangle definitely revisit connotation um, and get some terminology we can use for analyzing uh people's writing like this but the cool part of rhetoric is that you can pick up literally anything any piece of paper with writing on it you can turn on the tv or netflix and you'll be able to analyze anything there rhetorically so um it i think it's kind of fun but that is just me um you guys have a happy fourth if you are celebrating um and be safe and wear a mask and uh please don't have large gatherings